Hello world, this is Random Fix, and in this video today, I'm going to show you how to complete a drive cycle on a Ford 1996 and newer vehicle. And if you happen to have a different make, you'll find video descriptions below on Toyotas, Hondas, whatever it is, you'll find it down there. And in this video today, I'm going to show you three different drive cycle procedures to get your Ford ready for a smog. And if you guys got any questions, comment down below, and I'll be sure to get back to you. And let's get this video started. Hello world, this is Random Fix, and in this video today, I'm going to be covering with you guys the Ford drive cycle procedure. So if you need to get your vehicle an emissions test, you just purchased it, whatever the reason is, I'm going to show you how to do this in detail. So I'm actually doing this video because a few years ago, I made a video here on how to do a drive cycle in less than 12 miles and it was pretty successful. However, this video is a most common video because everybody needs help with their vehicle. However, since everybody has a different make and model, the procedure could be a little bit different. So if you guys want to see it in action, I'm going to have a link to this below. And you guys are welcome to check out the whole emissions test playlist here where I cover each particular monitor. And let me go ahead and get this started now for the Ford Drive Cycle Procedure. Thank you for joining me on this Drive Cycle video for Fords, Lincolns, Mercury, and even some Mazdas as well as certain Jaguars that were produced by Ford. And I think it was about a seven or eight year stretch until maybe 2006 or 2008 um, until Ford gave up control of Jaguar to Tata Corporation, and so this might apply to the X-Type and S-Type Jaguars as well. As I mentioned before, I'm going to include in three different procedures. So the drive cycle is something that needs to be completed on any vehicle that's 1996 and newer. And before we get into the actual drive cycle, I'm going to cover with you guys some of the basics so this is a OBD2 reader and it costs under $20. And this is the connector right here. And it connects to your vehicle's OBD2 port, which is located somewhere in your driver's side wheel well area. And it looks just like this guy right here. And the connector only goes in one way. When you plug it up, you should automatically get power to it and you want to make sure that the ignition is on with the motor off and the check engine light is on and i probably have over 20 videos on how to use an obd2 reader like this so check the description box below to find those videos and the very first thing is make sure when you're doing this drive cycle you do this while you follow all the local traffic laws and try to see if you could do it during off peak hours late in the night and try to see if maybe if you can find a backcountry road or open freeway because this will make it 100 times easier and before we jump into the drive cycle we need to know some basic vocabulary so we could understand what this little scan tool and what all these little monitors actually mean so the very first thing is if I refer to OBD2, it basically stands for Onboard Diagnostics Protocol 2. So before 1996, every vehicle make had their own connector. You would replace a little chipset in your device and see if you could get it to communicate. Basically, it was a big old mess and there was no standardized testing. And after 1996, they started using this OBD2 protocol and it's a simple little connector that goes in one way and it lets you know what's happening with the vehicle by giving you a DTC or diagnostic trouble code and there's two different kinds of DTCs 
One is, can be a pending code or a hard set code. So a pending code is a code that the computer has detected, but it isn't really sure yet if that code is real. So it's looking for more data. However, it has not triggered your check engine light. Versus a hard set code, this is a confirmed problem and the computer has gone ahead and also triggered your check engine light on. And no matter how many times you erase your check engine light, if you have a hard set code, for example, if your wires to your oxygen sensor are cut, you will get a check engine light back on immediately without even driving the vehicle. So pay attention to that. And we have something called MIL. So basically this is you're going to be your check engine light or a malfunction indicator light, AKA the check engine light, service engine light, service engine soon light, etc. And when you're using one of these OBD2 little readers here, and I'm going to have a link to it in the video box below. Uh, you're going to see a few different messages. One of them is going to be OK, which means that that monitor is complete, it's set, and it's ready. These are all the same exact thing. And if you see where it says INC, this means that it's incomplete, it's unset, and it's not ready. And if you see an NA, Basically, this means that it does not apply. So if you have an NA showing on your OBD2 reader for your Ford vehicle, you can basically skip that monitor. Then we have something called the O2 sensor. This is your oxygen sensor. And most vehicles are 1996 and newer. On a four-cylinder vehicle, for example, have two oxygen sensors. One is before the catalyst or the catalytic converter, and one is after the catalytic converter. So the one that's after is called a post cat or downstream, and the one that's before the catalyst is called a pre cat and or the upstream oxygen sensor. We have a monitor that's called the EGR, which stands for the exhaust gas recirculation. And I'm going to show you how to get all of these monitors set on your Fords. And we have something called a CAT, CATS, Catalyst. These basically are referring to the catalytic converter, which is the part. And the CAT monitor is the monitor for the catalyst. And we have the EVAP, which is basically the evaporative emissions control system. And in short, the EVAP system keeps the gas fumes out of the atmosphere. We have something on a Ford that's kind of unique. It's a diagnostic trouble code or a DTC P1000. And the P means it's for the powertrain. P1000 is basically a DTC on the computer that will be stored until everything is ready. So if you have a P1000, keep driving. And that's basically what that means, that it, the uh, computer's not ready. We have an HEGO monitor, or the HEGO monitor, which basically stands for the Heated Exhaust Gas Oxygen Sensor. We have a secondary air injection system here. And we have a CCM, basically, which stands for Comprehensive Component Monitor. And I'm going to cover this a little bit more in depth because there's two sides to this monitor. So one side checks for the engine, the other side checks for the transmission. So before you start your drive cycle, we're going to go into some requirements. And one of the very first ones is going to be make sure your gas level is going to be half to about three quarters of a tank or 50 to 75% full and so you don't want to be empty or full and this is necessary because your Ford requires a specific amount of fuel to vapor ratio to ensure an accurate measurement and this is often overlooked but park on a level surface ensure your battery and alternator are in good condition 
because if your battery and alternator are not in a good condition, no matter how well you do this test or how many times you do it, you will not be able to go ahead and get the monitors set, especially if there's a lot of corrosion or you got a weak battery and it's just not going to go well. So this is the very first thing I would actually try to go check is to make sure that the battery and the alternator are healthy. And it's very simple to do this. And I'll have a video link down below. You want to double check the doors are locked the night before and keep the keys away from the vehicle and the keys out of the ignition. A lot of the newer vehicles sense the keys if they're too close and they might not let it go into like a complete sleep mode. So you want to make sure that doesn't happen. As you're doing the test, avoid hills. And this is very important because you don't want the fuel to basically gush around in the back in the fuel tank. Finish any repairs and you want to clear all fault coats that morning that you're going to go and perform this test. And if you have a stopwatch, it'll make it easier for you to time everything as you're doing the test. On 1996 through 99 uh, gasoline powered vehicles, you can have one monitor that's not ready. So the EVAP monitor is one uh, basically where you can exempt it and you can still pass a smog test. And on a 2000 and newer, some states allow one monitor basically to be exempt, which is going to be normally the EVAP monitor. However, I'm finding most states are getting stricter and stricter on this policy. And sometimes even the smog technician themselves, they don't want to let the vehicle pass if the EVAP isn't ready, even though they can, because they get dinged a point or it counts against their ratings on their license so you want to keep that into account i normally just go drive to the next mock station and get the vehicle to pass because i think that whole rule is silly and a technical note the ford cadillac monitor will not run until the oxygen monitor is basically set and so keep that into account if ever your catalyst is not ready and your oxygen sensor is not ready Always pay attention to the oxygen sensor on any Ford vehicle. Before you complete your drive cycle, keep into account the morning when you start the vehicle, you want to look at the outside temperature. If the temperature is between 40 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you should be okay. And you don't have to do the step 13 bypass because if the temperature is below 40 or above 100, degrees Fahrenheit, what will happen is the EVAP monitor will not run. So keep this in mind as you're doing your test. It also takes into account your elevation as well. If you're over 8,000 feet in elevation, the EVAP monitor test will not run too. So you'll have to perform a step 13 bypass, which I'll cover with you guys. It's pretty simple. So step one of this 13 step procedure is going to be to know that this test is only going to be successful if you can have a light or steady foot as you're driving and you want to drive in a very smooth manner because it will reduce the amount of time that it will take to complete the test. Step two, we covered the gas between 50 to 75 percent full. And step three is we're going to go and make sure that the fuel doesn't slosh around in the back and that the EVAP monitor is only going to run for the first 30 minutes if we're within this operating range and under 8,000 feet in elevation. And now we're going to be getting ready to actually do the drive cycle. So for the Fords, you really do need an OBD2 reader to check the status and the progress you're making. So you want to install the scan tool turn the ignition key to basically where the check engine light is on but the vehicle is not running. Select your vehicle and you want to clear all the codes in the vehicle. So you're getting a, a fresh start that morning as you're about to start the vehicle. 
Now you want to start your Ford and you want to let it idle for 15 seconds. And as soon as you idle for 15 seconds, you want to go ahead and proceed to drive at 40 miles an hour until the engine coolant temperature is at least 170 degrees. And the key word here is least. So if you get it to 180 degrees, 183 degrees, there's nothing wrong with that. So that's why it really pays to have a little bit better of a scan tool. And it may cost you 50 bucks versus $20, but it, it will make sure that you got the coolant temperature correct and you're going to go and complete this a lot faster without having to drive hundreds of miles to get this vehicle to pass this mog test. So we got the vehicle now to 170 degrees and you can achieve operating temperature by driving for about 10 to 15 minutes. And step five, you want to go ahead and cruise at 40 miles an hour for four minutes. And this helps that heated exhaust gas sensor get ready. Step six, you're going to cruise between 45 to 65 miles an hour for 10 minutes and avoid hills, sharp turns, and this helps set that EVAP monitor. And you want to keep your f speed wherever you land, whether it's 50 or 55 at a constant, 50 or 55. So that way the EVAP monitor is able to set. Step seven, you're going to go and drive your vehicle in stop and go traffic and include in a total of five different constant cruise speeds. So you could drive at a total maybe of 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour for a period of 10 uh, minutes. And this helps set that catalyst monitor. So if your catalyst monitor on your Ford isn't getting ready, step seven is where you want to come back to and visit the step many times. And step eight. From a stop, accelerate to 45 miles an hour at half to three-fourths throttle. Repeat this pattern three times. And this helps set that EGR monitor. And step nine, bring your Ford basically to a complete stop and idle your transmission in drive or in neutral if you have a manual transmission. And this helps set that CCM for the engine side. And step 10, this is going to help set the CCM basically for the transmission side. From a complete stop, you're going to go ahead and put the vehicle in overdrive. And then you're going to accelerate 50 miles an hour and cruise for 15 seconds. Then you're going to stop the vehicle and repeat the same thing with the overdrive off to 40 miles an hour for 30 seconds. After that, you're going to go ahead and at 40 miles an hour, you're going to activate the overdrive and accelerate to 50 miles an hour. And then you're going to cruise for 15 seconds and activate the overdrive and accelerate to 50 miles an hour and hold the speed for 15 seconds. And you want to stop for at least 20 seconds and then you want to repeat everything in this section here. Step 10, a total of five times. So this step 10 can take a few minutes. And if you have a manual transmission, these are the shift points. So you want to shift from first to second at 13 to 15 miles an hour and so on. And from a stop, you want to accelerate to 65 miles an hour and then decelerate at closed throttle. So basically don't have your foot on the gas at all to 40 miles an hour or under without touching the brake. So you want to make sure that you get to 65 miles an hour, take your foot off the gas pedal and let the vehicle just coast to under 40 without hitting the brake. Repeat this pattern three times and this helps set that misfire and fuel monitors hey guys really quick if you're finding this video to be helpful and you're enjoying the content please consider hitting that thumbs up button and subscribing to the channel as well 
as it lets YouTube and me know that I'm doing a good job and bringing you guys value content. Thanks. And step 12, this is where we're going to check for pending codes and the, if your eval monitor isn't set, we're going to show you how to do that in here in step 13. Now you could go ahead and check the monitors and if any of them are incomplete, you could go ahead and focus on the ones that are incomplete. So basically, you're going to grab your scan tool and check for any pending codes. If you do have some issues that need to be addressed, you're going to go and make the repairs, come back to this and retry again. Otherwise, focus on the incomplete monitors. So if the catalyst isn't ready, you want to go focus on the catalyst monitor. And again, if your EVAP isn't ready because the temperature was colder than 40 degrees and over 100, you want to make sure that you go to step 13, which we're going to cover now. Now step 13, because your temperature was colder than 40 and over 100 and or your elevation was over 8,000 feet, you basically need to get the EVAP system to bypass this. And the way you do it is when you come back from your drive cycle, you want to park the vehicle on level surface for eight hours. And then what you want to do is you want to repeat step two through step 12 again. And if you do this successfully, it'll bypass the EVAP monitor. And make sure you do not repeat step one unless you made a repair here. And this is the conclusion of the first drive cycle. And now we're going to focus on some other Fords, a newer vehicle, and you want to go and get that vehicle ready. Here's some preconditioning requirements for those vehicles. Again, you want to let the vehicle sit for eight hours. You want to make sure there's no diagnostic treble codes present or pending. The gas level is 15 to 85 percent. I always think it's safe to go with that 70 percent mark as it leaves less of a chance for the EVAP monitor not to get it right. So the driving for procedures for this are a lot simpler. The first thing you want to do is leave the vehicle in park and you want to let it idle for four minutes. And once the vehicle has idled for four minutes in park, and uh, you want to then put it in gear into the drive gear and let it idle for another 40 seconds. And if you have a manual transmission, you're going to just leave it in neutral. And you're going to accelerate now to 45 miles an hour using a quarter to about half throttle. And if you have a manual transmission, make sure you stay in second gear for at least five seconds. And then you want to accelerate for at least 10 seconds and shift through the gears until you get to the fifth gear. And here's the shifting points for the vehicles with manual transmissions. Step four, you want to drive with a steady throttle at speeds of 45 miles an hour for 30 seconds. You want to stop the vehicle, idle and drive, or in neutral for manual transmissions for 40 seconds. Step six, you want to drive at speeds between 25 to 45 miles an hour for 15 minutes and use quarter to about half throttle and make sure that you do a few other things and one of them is going to be you stop five times within 10 seconds of idle and you want to keep your speed consistent possibly at three different uh, speeds so maybe you want to do 25 miles an hour for a minute and a half 30 miles an hour for a minute and a half and 35 miles an hour for a minute and a half and keep into consideration the older your vehicle is the harder it is for some of these components to get ready. Keep your vehicle's age, condition, and mileage into account. Drive the vehicle between 45 to 60 miles an hour for 8 minutes. So be in your drive gear with overdrive on or your 5th gear. Maintain 
a steady speed between 45 to 60 miles an hour for five minutes. Step nine, drive the vehicle between 45 and 60 miles an hour for eight minutes and use your highest gear. Step 10, stop the vehicle while it's in drive and let it idle for a total of 40 seconds. So once the 40 seconds is up, you want to go ahead and put the vehicle in park. You want to scan it. And if everything is done, it'll say zero codes incomplete, seven that are complete, and four that don't apply, and zero codes found. And this is a 100% chance that you're going to go ahead and pass your emissions tests as long as you haven't altered anything on your vehicle. And your vehicle passes the visual inspection as well, which... I'll cover it a little bit later. Now, if you have an older Ford like an Escort, here's some preconditioning requirements. Again, you want to park on level ground. The check engine light must be off. There cannot be any diagnostic trouble codes pending or preset. The vehicle must be cold, and the temperature is going to be between 68 and 86 at starting. And so you may have to really time this for the time of the day and do this first thing in the morning if you live in a hotter climate. The gas has to be between 15 to 85. Again, I would really recommend that you keep it at that 70% mark here and make sure all the accessories are off. So your AC, your rear defrost have to be off. And here's the procedure. So you start the vehicle and let it idle for five minutes in park. And then you want to put the vehicle in neutral if you have a manual transmission or leave it in park for automatic transmissions. And at 2300 to 2700 RPM for 15 seconds. Then you want to go and increase the RPM to 38 to 4200 RPMs for 15 seconds. You want to let the vehicle idle for 20 seconds with the cooling fan stopped. So if the cooling fan turns on during this test, wait for the cooling fan to turn off. Once the cooling fans turn off, then start timing the 20 seconds for step four. Accelerate between 52 to 55 miles an hour. Maintain speeds. Be in your highest gear for at least a minute and a half. So for automatic vehicles, you're going to be in drive with overdrive on. And for manual transmissions, you're going to be in fifth gear. And then you want to go and accelerate to 15 miles an hour. Then drive for 13 minutes at speeds ranging between 15 to 35 miles an hour. And seven, maintain a steady speed of 25 miles an hour for 50 seconds. When you're done with all this, again, you want to plug in your OBD2 reader, check when monitors still incomplete, if any, and focus just on those monitors. Congrats, basically you've set all the monitors on your vehicle. And if your vehicle is a 1996 through 99, it will need to get tested on a dyno, the gas analyzer, they're going to check your gas cap. They're also going to pressurize your fuel system. So don't take it with a completely empty tank as this can cost some of the technicians more time and even more money because they have to pump a special gas into your gas tank in order to do this. And before you get there, you want to take your vehicle for a very long drive to get it to temperature. So that way everything will run nice and smooth. And when you're filling out the paperwork for your vehicle's emissions test, see if you can leave the vehicle running if possible. If your vehicle is 2000 and newer, you'll only need to do an OBD2 ready test. However, all vehicles are subject to a visual inspection. So make sure there's no altered parts on the vehicle like a cold air intake throttle spacers, missing catalysts. And one other thing to keep into account is some of the technicians may get on the gas pedal 
pretty heavy on the vehicle to see if it smokes as they romp on the gas. So keep that into account. And if your vehicle has a history of smoking like that, you may really want to change the oil before you get there. Maybe put some additives in the oil to make sure it doesn't smoke like that when he's testing it. And remember here in California that if the vehicle is between 96 through 99, that one of the monitors like the EVAP can sometimes be ignored and no pending codes. And 2000 and newer vehicles, make sure that the monitors are ready. And some states might let you pass it with the EVAP monitor not ready. So that's the only monitor that they may let you get away with. In this rule for the EVAP monitor for 2000 newer vehicles is constantly changing. So if you really want to know what's happening in your state, maybe look at the comments down below or you can check your state's website. You're watching this video because you just purchased a vehicle or you got to renew it. And a lot of times people end up buying a vehicle and they're not sure if it's going to pass or not and they end up getting a vehicle it may even for a good deal but it won't pass a smog test in california for example if that vehicle can't pass a smog test it can't be on the road too much longer so it is a seller's responsibility to basically take care of the smog and this is true for 90 percent of the states out there i haven't heard of one however just keep that into account and normally you want to make sure that you get the smog certificate with the pink slip when you're buying the vehicle and make sure that that smog is within the last 90 days and and if you want to sell your vehicle without a smog you definitely can you can sell it to a dealer or a dismantler because normally it's the seller's responsibility to give the buyer a valid smog certificate and this is something that cannot be waived by writing as is on the pink slip or making a side agreement. The smog certificate is a state requirement. So if ever you go to a court, most judges are going to rule in favor of the buyer because it is a seller's responsibility to give the buyer a smog certificate, no matter the case, unless it's exempt. And one other tip I wanted to give you guys is make sure whenever you're buying a vehicle always check the OBD2 port to make sure all the monitors are ready before you purchase it. If the monitors are not ready I can almost guarantee you that somebody purposely erased the data on the vehicle to get rid of a check engine light and in case you have the, the rare chance that the monitors are not ready because the battery died you still need to figure out why that battery died however it always throws off a red flag for me whenever I'm buying a vehicle and the monitors are not set it lets me know that I need to investigate further and maybe I want to come back and drive this vehicle another day or maybe first thing in the morning to see how it's behaving I made a list of the sensors in sequential order how they normally get ready so the very first monitor that normally gets ready is going to be the O2 oxygen sensor heater. So once this gets ready, what will happen then is the oxygen sensor gets ready. And the oxygen sensor is going to be basically two parts. So there's two oxygen sensors, for example, on an inline four-cylinder vehicle. There's going to be the pre-cat and the post-cat. And this is the upstream and downstream oxygen sensors. And I'm going to show you guys a diagram in the next coming slides of this. Then after the oxygen sensor normally gets ready, the EGR will get ready. And coasting really helps set this monitor, by the way. So if you guys ever run across any vehicle that the EGR is not getting ready, try going up to 65 miles an hour and see if you can back off the throttle completely. Let it go under 20 miles an hour without touching the brake and do that a few times. That helps the, the EGR get ready. After the oxygen sensor is gotten ready, the catalyst monitor on Fords especially will then get ready. However, if the oxygen sensor doesn't get ready, the catalyst normally does not get ready.
And the last monitor to normally get set is going to be the EVAP. And this can sometimes take a few days. And if you are testing your vehicle and it's taking longer than expected, be mindful of your gas level. So you might really have to go visit a gas station every other day to keep your fuel range between that 50 to 75% range for optimum chances that you're going to pass. So I have went ahead and drew a couple of diagrams for you guys. And on a typical four-cylinder motor here, you got two oxygen sensors and one catalyst. So if we look at this diagram here, the cylinders are basically all in line here. So they're all lined up at the top. And the reason why this is important is because there's only one side to the engine. So if it tells you bank one, it's going to be the whole engine here. And I'm going to show you guys the, the importance of this. On this four-cylinder vehicle, we have a upstream oxygen sensor, which is known as the pre-cat. We have the catalyst itself or the catalytic converter. We have the post cat or the downstream oxygen sensor. And these two oxygen sensors work together to measure the efficiency of the catalyst. And we're going to go jump over to a V6 motor. On a V6 motor, basically, this is the V of the vehicle. And you got three cylinders on one side, and you got three cylinders on the other side. Whichever cylinder is identified as cylinder number one, that's the side that's going to be bank one. So if you're running into some problems with the oxygen sensor and tells you that is bank two, sensor one, it's going to let you know that it's on the opposite side. So then I would know that this oxygen sensor is maybe the one that's acting up and I would go and investigate that. So this can be sometimes a little confusing. So on this V6 model, for example, we have more than two oxygen sensors because we have one here, we have one here, and we have one past the catalysts. So there's a total of three sensors in the catalyst. And in this example right here, the number one cylinder is on the left hand side here if this is the front of the motor here and this is the first cylinder so this is bank one in this situation and on an eight cylinder model normally there's four oxygen sensors and two catalysts so we have bank one here we have one sensor here we have another sensor here we have another sensor here and another sensor here. So this sensor over here is going to be sensor one, bank two. So this makes it easy for you to identify which sensor is acting up and possibly replace or investigate what's the actual reason why this sensor is giving you some trouble. And then we have two catalysts right here. And those are some things to keep in mind. And now I have eight tips for you guys to help pass your emissions test. And the very first tip is make sure your vehicle is running right. You want to seek professional assistance when you first test a vehicle as anything that happens to your vehicle's emission will be reported to Carfax Auto Check. And if you have a failed emissions on your vehicle, this can actually reduce the value of your vehicle. If I was a car buyer and I saw that a vehicle failed emissions twice, I might pay a little bit less for that vehicle versus a vehicle that didn't have any history of failing emissions tests. So always plan ahead and pass the very first time. And this is very easy, especially with the $20 OBD2 reader. You can tell if your car is ready or not. And second, make sure your vehicle's check engine light is actually working and that it should be off and so if you want to test it just put the key in the ignition cycle it to where the ignition is on but the motor is not running and you should see that the check engine light is there 
start the vehicle, and within about 20 seconds, the check engine light should be off. Third, you want to inflate the tires to the right pressure because any vehicle that's 1996 through 99 will get tested on a dyno, and this will reduce the load on the engine if your tires are actually inflated correctly. Change your oil on any vehicle that's 96 through 99 because it reduces the hydrocarbons and allows for better operation. And all we're looking for is to increase the odds that our vehicle is going to pass. Tip number five, take the vehicle for a drive. So take your vehicle for a long test drive before you go to the smog station and see if you can leave it on. And doing this will make sure that those components stay nice and hot and you'll have better results. Step six, use fuel additives. So I like using the Lucas Oil upper cylinder lube with injector cleaner. And this is really nice because I want to make sure that my vehicle is running in optimum condition. This is especially true of 1996 through 99 vehicles that are going to get tested. So a clogged injector can really cause havoc on your smog results. So try running this in your vehicle every three or 4,000 miles and it's pretty affordable as well. And I'll have a link to this. Avoid wet weather. Since your vehicle is going to get tested on the dyno at 15 miles an hour and 25 miles an hour under a load. Anything that you can do to get rid of any possible situations that can cause additional stress on your vehicle, such as a slipping dyno or wet wheels, you want to do that. And this is not to say you cannot pass an emissions test when it's raining. It just increases your odds doing it on a dry day. Number eight, do not disconnect the battery unless you save the data. So they make these cool little scan tool plugs that basically plug into your vehicle and can plug into another vehicle or a jump pack and it saves the data on your computer. So you don't have to go through this whole drive cycle procedure because it can seriously take up hours of your time and you could end up spending 10, 20, 30 dollars in gas just to get your vehicle's monitors to set. And remember guys, oftentimes the only real solution to your vehicle's issue is to repair or replace that. So I get a lot of questions on how do I fix my catalyst? How do I fix uh, the P420, P430 code? And I have a couple of videos in the description box below. If you need to get your vehicle to pass for the next one or two years, I can show you how to do it. But oftentimes, you're going to have to replace that catalyst. So that catalyst is very expensive. I'll have a video down there too on how to get it for dirt cheap. So check that out. But again, remember the only real solution is to repair or replace that component. There is no magical bottle that you could throw down the gas tank and it will take care of all the problems. And the last thing that I want to leave you guys off with is the key to successful vehicle ownership is going to be really preventive maintenance. So I have some prevention tips. You want to try to see if you can do some of the easy repairs yourself. Some of the things such as the oil changes, transmission fluid changes, differential fluid changes, uh, change your air filter, your cabin air filter. Clean the throttle body, especially on a 96 through 99 vehicle. This really gives you a much better chance of passing the smog test the very first time. And by doing this, you oftentimes save yourself a lot of money. And more important, you'll learn. And then you know you're confident to take on the next challenge. So I hope the video was helpful. If it was, please, guys, comment down below. Let me know how I did. And if you need additional help, please comment down. I'll be sure to get back to you. And if you guys are new to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button right here and smash on the notification button as well. All right, guys, there you guys go. Your Ford drive cycle is complete. If the video is helpful, make sure you guys give the video a thumbs up. And I really appreciate you guys watching. And if you guys are new to the channel, consider subscribing as it would really help me out. 
and it lets YouTube know that I'm doing a good job in bringing you guys value content, and we'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks.